Jacksonville seems to be increasingly concerned about environmental issues, the quality of the air we breathe, protecting our water supply, disposing of waste. Today we're going to talk with some experts in this area about environmental issues facing Jacksonville in the future. Let me introduce our panel. Dr. Catherine Christie, a nutritionist with University Hospital. Nelson Helmuth, professional engineer and a co-owner of a health food store. Bob Grimes, a member of the Environmental Protection Board and a member of the Sierra Club. Bruce Dueck, division chief of the Energy Conservation Office at the Jacksonville Electric Authority. John Crofts, chief of the Comprehensive Planning Division of the city's planning department. Bill Vockel, professor of the Department of Natural Sciences at Florida Junior College. Al Spiker, president of Jacksonville Citizens Against Contaminated Water. Jim Baker, design engineer and environmental activist. Dr. Quentin White, marine biologist, associate professor of biology and marine science at Jacksonville University. And Ernest Fry, hazardous waste supervisor with the Florida Department of Environmental Regulation. We've heard a lot lately about uh, air quality in Jacksonville, particularly odors, and I guess we can safely assume that the city is on its way to dealing with that problem, but there may be some other problems in the area of air quality that we ought to discuss. Bob Grimes, what about it? Well, Harry, I, I think everybody's in agreement that our greatest polluter as far as air quality is concerned is the automobile. Uh, you can't smell that, though, and uh, the the attention lately has been on odors, but that's followed by electrical power generation, and then after that, probably industrial boilers and home heating. Uh, most of those things, as I say, are very dangerous, but not uh, so evident as odors. Uh, odors are more of a nuisance thing, and uh, but we're taking steps for all of those now. Well, what do we do about automobile pollution? Probably the, the biggest contribution there is the removal of uh, leaded gasoline. And of course, that's on its way out. Uh, if we can get leaded gasoline out and also encourage people not to disassemble uh, the pollution equipment on their automobiles, uh, not to use these uh, adapters for uh, leaded gasoline into non-leaded fuel systems, uh, we can make a, a great contribution. And in fact, I hope we have some type of legislation uh, shortly to regulate that. We can help with the uh, air pollution from automobiles is try to improve the traffic patterns and can uh, move those tie-ups that we have in our traffic patterns now, move them on down the line so we don't have that big backup of, of pollutants right there in one portion of the, uh, the interstate system or the traffic pattern system in the city. And I think uh, they were talking about working on that also. One of the things that probably hasn't gotten as much attention as, it, uh, as, as what we've been talking about is indoor air quality. What about it, Bruce? Well, indoor air quality is becoming a very big issue uh, in conservation now because we're making our homes tighter and tighter. And as a result, all the potential pollutants are becoming more and more of a problem. And there are lots of sources of indoor pollutants, uh, ranging with the cleansers and solvents and so forth used in the homes, aerosols and so on, smoke from smoking, uh, combustion products from um, oil and gas uh, heating systems. Uh, these sorts of things can become a problem uh, because you spend so much time in the home. In addition to those sources of potential pollutants, there are uh, the building materials in many cases. Uh, plywood, uh, the glues there have a lot of formaldehyde. The carpets, uh, drapes, furniture, um, these are sources of formaldehyde in the home. And probably the biggest source or the biggest problem uh, right now is radon gas. And radon gas comes from several sources. Um, the concrete slab sometimes, the soil itself, water sometimes, the groundwater can be a source of radon gas. So we need to be aware of these problems. And Another environmental issue that uh is beginning to get an awful lot of attention is the safe disposal of hazardous waste. A lot of us had a chance to uh, get rid of some household items at the state's recent amnesty days, but what's the, uh, what's the permanent ongoing solution to that problem? Ernie Fry. Harry, uh, I'd like to explain how the current methods of disposal, what we do in the state of Florida right now. As it stands right now in the state, 
the generators of hazardous waste have to send that waste either to Alabama or South Carolina for disposal. The uh, legislature last year determined that we will not have a hazardous waste landfill in the state of Florida. So that limits our disposal techniques that are available to us in this state. Um, it's a good idea not to have a hazardous waste landfill because of our groundwater problems we have in the state. Uh, we have problems enough with our normal sanitary landfills, not, uh, not even to mention hazardous waste. But currently what we're trying to do is um, limit the types of materials that are being used so we limit the generation of the waste. The industry has taken that upon themselves uh, quite a bit now to go to solvents and types of the materials that would not be classified as hazardous. And that's probably what been one of the big steps. Another step is that uh, we've developed an industry now who is using or reusing the ignitable wastes. Uh, we have a couple of those in the uh, area here that are using the waste and generating heat with that waste and using it in their process. So that's been a, a boom for the disposal of ignitables. But still we have our, uh, our material that has, has to go to a landfill, and that's Alabama and South Carolina as it stands right now. Well, can Florida expect to continue to use Alabama and South Carolina, or eventually the state of Florida may have to provide for its own waste disposal? Right. Um, both of those landfills, South Carolina and Alabama, are coming under very strict scrutiny under the new reauthorization program that uh, EPA has just adopted for hazardous waste. So I'm sure that as, as that landfill tightens up, Florida is going to have to go to something else. And what we're looking at now is incineration, the chemical, the breakdown of the material through uh, superheating, and also chemical treatment. And uh, by treating uh, such things as metal waste, we can render them less hazardous and reduce the volume of material that needs to be disposed of and extend the life of, our, of, of the landfills in Alabama and South Carolina. I think that's going on over most of the nation right now at this time. I think one of the problems in Alabama is that uh, they're in such a, a, a geological formation. They thought, they thought that they were, they were in a very safe formation, but recent history has proven that that may not be true. And that could cause uh, some problems as far as the disposal technique in, in that state. But again, we keep hearing the rumblings from Alabama that uh, why should we take waste from Florida? Uh, they don't take our waste, so they can't shut us off by the uh, federal regulations, but they can make life much more difficult for the generators to dispose of their waste. And I'm sure that's going to happen. Well, Arnie, this <clears throat> that fact disturbs me because one of the problems with hazardous waste disposal is the, the fact that it can permeate our very existence. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we make it difficult for large manufacturers to dispose of hazardous waste, they're simply going to turn to illegal means of disposing it, which are even more damaging to our water and air quality and ultimately our, our, our health. I think we've got to take some rather drastic steps to make it as easy for someone to dispose of hazardous waste as possible. The, anything that you do to, to tighten up the system, uh, while it may sound good in some respects, in the long term is going to affect the general public. Okay. That's right. I think that uh, <coughs> authorities realize now they're going to have to make some type of incentive to disposal of these waste. If, if it keeps getting more and more expensive, our problem is going to get greater and greater. We found that illegal disposal is not a problem with the major disposal people. If there is a market for something, someone will fill that vacuum. Uh, that's why we're looking forward to uh, chemical treatment and possibly incineration in the state. Because landfilling is not really a good method. All it is is long-term storage. Sooner or later, that waste is going to have to be addressed again. Uh, that's why we would like to chemically alter this material so it's not hazardous anymore. And I think that's where the major effort's going to be placed. Of course, the real problem here, as you've pointed out, is protecting the water supply. And uh, Alice Barker, you've had some firsthand experience with the consequences of uh, waste disposal. Uh, yes, we have. We've had uh, one of those uh, waste sites where perhaps for whatever reason it might have been more economical to utilize third-party disposal. Uh, services. Uh, we found that, uh, as Bruce was alluding to earlier, that our home was, uh, we've got a lot of contaminants in our area and our immediate neighborhood that has absolutely nothing to do with the construction of the home, but with what someone disposed of uh, in our immediate uh, adjacent landfill. But uh, I do agree. Uh, I think that probably the most positive effort that our government and legislative bodies can do in this effort is not tighten up on how these things are handled from a, a a functional point, but perhaps from an administrative point, 
functionally, we must make it economically feasible for waste generators to actively participate in, in proper methods of disposal. The, the more regulations we place on them that cost them more money to dispose of, the more we are forcing those people to find alternative methods. Those methods may be legal, barely legal, or illegal. But in either case, a business must exist and it will continue to generate waste. And I think it's something that uh, we have tried, our citizens group has tried to convey when we've gone to Washington on several occasions to work in the lobbying efforts for Superfund. Basically, we feel that there's got to be a synergistic effort between the waste generators, the waste producers, the chemical producers, and the community, and it's the only way. Perhaps the chemical conversion of these materials is a solution, but certainly dumping it into the land and waiting for it to show up somewhere in someone else's lives is simply not a solution. We've, we've gained that much information over the years. Duval County is moving to help reduce the cost to the generators uh, by establishing a collection site for hazardous waste so that they can get the, the benefit of bulk shipment of the material. And I think that's, that's a good step. It's just an intermediate step, but it will help reduce the cost to, to the generators in the area. Right now, a generator has to pay for the, the cost to haul that one or two or three or four drums to Alabama, where if we can get a collection center here in the city, we can get that bulk rate of 80 or 90 drums on a trailer instead of the one or two. And I think that would be a big help to the, to the generators here locally. I think an example that's very common and that the Amnesty Day has brought some light on is waste motor oil. I think that all of us are aware that you can go to a discount store and buy motor oils and oil filters <coughs> much cheaper than you can go pay a filling station or your automobile dealership to change your oil and filter. However, an awful lot of this oil, I don't think much of it gets dumped on the ground as it used to, but a lot of it gets put into milk containers and so forth and put into trash collection. And there it shows up here in the landfill. And I, I don't know specifically what the uh, ratio would be on motor oil, but I think it's true that a gallon of gasoline can pollute a million gallons of groundwater. And so we're talking about something that seems rather innocuous to the average homeowner or automobile user. He thinks he's doing himself and everyone a good turn by changing his own oil and stuff, and he may be contributing to a long-range detriment of the environment in a very serious way. We think that this is probably the key here, is, is generating a public awareness, establishing a facility where people can, can participate, actively participate, like just, uh, areas to collect waste oils. But I think, too, uh, that it's something that's key here is that Ernie brought up is that the sanitary landfills, as we understand them today, even though they're not, quote, necessarily classified as toxic, toxic waste uh, sites, the materials that are currently going in there will eventually be classified as toxic waste. And when they filter into the groundwater and destroy uh, another, another supply of uh, fresh drinking water to the city of Jacksonville or other communities, uh, this again will become another issue. It's a little bit further down the road because it's not uh, something that uh, as soon as it's introduced like gasoline or oil, it immediately destroys it. But something that uh, pesticides, plastics, and all those uh, degreasing agents and stuff, when they're mixed in a sanitary landfill, compressed and sat underground for a while, they mix and merge and come up with new chemicals we've never even heard of before or be able to deal with. So I think that the sanitary landfills uh, should not be treated much differently than what we consider today to be, the quote, the toxic waste dump facility. I think it's, an, again, another area of public awareness. Well, there, the landfills have a responsibility to monitor the groundwater around that facility. And uh, that is going to be another burden that the city is going to have to bear and the public is going to have to bear if a major landfill does start contaminating the groundwater, there's going to be a major cleanup to stop that pollution from moving any further. And somebody's going to have to bear the cost of that. And so I think that's another thing that has to be looked at, even in sanitary landfills, that there must be a better way of handling our trash than burying it in the ground and storing it up for something else to happen. And I think the city is looking into uh, an incineration for that as an also a method of generating power. I think that, that could go a long way to helping. Which advantages, generating power, getting rid of uh, waste. And, and recycling the material as it comes right. out the, the tail end of the uh, incinerator. They can also be done. The metals and, and some of the glass can also be recycled. So there's a major benefit to that if we can get the city to move in that direction. Something this is something that uh, is really the wave of the future. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about it for years, and that is, you know, just extensive recycling of resources. And if we track all these resources, our minerals, our chemicals, whatever it is that we're generating, and start to recycle recycle them, 
then we'll find ultimately that I think this resource management, just the whole attitude towards resource management will be very helpful in dealing with our overall problems. Another aspect of uh, protecting our water quality is protecting the state's wetlands. Uh, Bill Buckle can tell us a little bit about that. <coughs> well, it concerns me that um, we're talking about chemicals and things that uh, we have with us. Uh, maybe, too, we need to talk about the things that are still okay, but that we need to protect. Uh, one of those that concerns me uh, very much is uh, here in Duval County are our wetlands, uh, particularly the salt marshes, which are adjacent to the ocean. They're uh, by nature part salt water, part fresh water, and by uh, reputation now are the most productive lands in the world, not ours, but all, all those, uh, those types of uh, marshes. Um, we have some videotape here that will uh, show you a little bit of this land, and um, what happens is that we look at that land as, as areas that can be developed. They look like wastelands. They're uh, mud and muck and mosquitoes, and um, doesn't seem to be too much there, but we then look towards it as an area we can go for, an area that we can uh, develop as land becomes more and more scarce in other places. We start early on by uh, some very simple bulkheading, uh, by placing rocks, what have you, at the edge of the water to protect the, the buildings that we've put up there. The the land then is protected, but we have done some harm to it, which we're not really able to determine yet. We build houses right out to the very edge, and uh, here we see some land th that has been built upon just immediately south of the Beach Boulevard uh, bridge, uh, uh, right on the salt marsh itself. Um, further on down, we see uh, the, uh, this, this tape here was taken three years ago. It's right next to the J. Turner Butler Bridge, looking south. Uh, a few docks down in there. Doesn't look like much at this point, but a little later on, like three months ago, we happen to be back in the same area, and we see an entirely different view of this very same piece of property. Here we have development going on. Yes, it's only a little bit of development, but this kind of development builds on itself, and uh, once uh, you've broken the vacuum, so to speak, here we go with a little bit more of it. I think Bill is exactly right. Something around 80% of our commercial fisheries are directly dependent on estuaries and salt marshes for their very existence. And one of the ironies, and I think Bill has stated it quite nicely, and we need to emphasize it, is that People are building and bulkheading and destroying the very environment they're trying to utilize and enjoy. I guess uh, the kinds of questions we're talking about lead us into discussions of growth management, planning, and zoning. John Crofts, uh, can we look to uh, protection through zoning and planning? We, uh, in the planning department of the city of Jacksonville, have just completed a couple of endeavors that are going to be proposals uh, to, the, to the community and the city uh, dealing with uh, environmental related issues and one has to deal with, uh, one of those particular programs has to do with uh, uh, the uh, particular salt marsh areas in the northeastern part of the county. Uh, obviously the concern for the environment uh, is a very big uh, factor in our comprehensive planning efforts. So the wetlands property of the state? And if so, then how can an independent contractor or builder actually purchase those lands and redevelop it, as we saw in this uh, video? The, uh, the determination uh, of whether it's privately or public owned is basically in terms of the water flow, uh, I guess the mean high water line, of uh, whether it's uh, sort of surface, surface water or whether it is not. And some of these wetlands are not necessarily that way. Uh, so it's sort of a mixed bag in terms of who owns them, both, both public and private, I, I think, is, is the answer to that question. Uh, what we're trying to do is, uh, uh, when developments come before us, uh, we are in our review processes attempting to incorporate 
the, uh, the wetlands really in the design of that particular development. We've been talking about some big environmental issues, uh, citywide, statewide, worldwide, perhaps. Uh, what about uh, on the individual level, uh, all of our personal environment? Uh, Dr. Catherine Christie, what can you tell us? I think it's appropriate that we talk about um, our personal environment in, the dis in this discussion. We've talked a lot about things that affect our, our global environment, but um, our bodies are as a system similarly to the environment that we've been talking about in terms of physical environment. Um, traditionally, I think physicians and dietitians and nutritionists that are working in, in healthcare have been viewed as helping people when they're sick. And what has changed some, I think, in the past few years, and I think the direction that we'll be going in the future, is more of a preventive sort of mechanism for helping people maintain their health and keeping that system in a good balance. Um, when you look at the risk factors for the major diseases in terms of killers in this country, heart disease, cancer, um, and some of the diseases that develop with the aging process, there are dietary factors associated with those diseases. And not only are there dietary factors, but also other lifestyle modifications that can be made on a personal, individual level that may affect what happens in terms of these long-term um, disease processes. It is important to talk about the individual choices we make. Um, I'm wearing two hats today. I'm an engineer and also a health food store owner. So as an engineer, I see people making personal choices every day which bother me. And I'd like to challenge everyone out there to actually look at themselves and look very closely at the choices you make every single day. Real quickly, we've talked about air quality, the automobile, number one pollution. How many people carpool? How many people make the choice to take the extra effort to carpool? We could cut 50% of the automobile air pollution tomorrow if everyone made the choice. Hazardous waste, what do we choose to put on our lawns? The fertilizers, the pesticides, what do we choose? Every day I see people out there spraying chemicals. It gets washed into the water supply. These are personal choices that we can make. The physical environment, the pollution inside the house. We talked about wood stoves. You can buy right now wood stoves which will not pollute. People don't make the choice. They don't want to pay the few extra hundred dollars to buy one that won't pollute. Um, I'd like to say that everyone on this panel this morning, everyone here has the capability and everyone here has uh, resources that are going to waste. We have people here from the Sierra Club, the EPA, they know how to handle these problems and it was brought up, the public just doesn't seem to care. Unless somebody's own house is threatened, all of a sudden they jump up. Everyone should be concerned and it's, it's really a personal solution. I just say people on this panel are begging to have the public come to them and ask them what they can do because there are solutions. I, I get two people a year asking me how to build a solar house, but I can build a solar house that uses one-tenth the energy of a house that's being built now. But people don't ask me. They don't even come up and ask the question. So I think it's important everyone out there ask the question, what can you do? And we have solutions. The solutions are here. It's not something that you just cannot do that we have to throw up our hands with. And the personal thing about diet, we have solutions out there about lifestyle changes. We know what can reduce the risk of cancer in your body. We know that, and yet every day we see people out there eating food that's bad for them because it's a personal choice. And so I think it's very important to realize these, these problems have been solved if we want to take the personal incentive to do it. But we don't. We actually, all the people on this panel, like I say, are going wanting people to come up and, and ask them and get involved in solving these problems. I think those are excellent points. I, I only wish we had time to continue this discussion. I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope we've stimulated your interest. I want to thank the panel for being here and thank you for watching.